transparent so that we so that we are able to grow as Christians. We saw last week, we saw the need, or we talked about the need for growth and the dangers of not growing, why it is necessary to grow so that the dangers did not happen. But it's very important for us to grow as Christians. We have been planted to grow. So today we want to continue with the lesson number five, where we are talking about true spiritual growth. Uh, it leads from a believer to a disciple. A disciple is a person who learns in humility. A believer can be somebody who can be rebellious and causing problems, even in the midst of brethren. So we want to see how a believer can tra um, transform or transition from a, a believer, from a believer to a follower or a disciple. One of the most um, important dangers that saints must avoid to be spiritually stuck in a state where their belief on Jesus Christ is essentially a matter of selfish necessity. Coming to the Lord because I'm afraid if I die today, he will ask me, what do you know about me? Many are just coming to soothe their conscience in the church. If we are to follow him, we have got to follow his commandment. In other words, these people, they believe on him to save them from Satan, the devil, from sin, and to protect them from evil people and the demons, and to provide their needs for marriage, family, job security, business, financial independence, so that they can live a good life. So this is one of, this is what we are calling a selfish necessity. So this this selfish perspective is at the heart of the utilitarian gospel, the chief offer of a new plastic cross, where the devil carries the cross for you, but you pay the price by giving your soul. These are the dangers. So basically, it represents God as existing to service our needs. That's why people say, God, I want you. God is not an angel. He does not minister to you. We save him because he created us. Why is it dangerous? Because when we are coming to God to service our needs, this is a perfection of epic proportions. You are coming to God to extract something from him. Anyone caught up um, in it in is it stuck as a babe and you will never grow. That's why we've got the babyhood syndrome where people are several years in church and they never grow. No wonder why most churches are filled with a mass of consumerist babes who hang on every word of their preferred preacher or pastors with no desire to know God for themselves. Pastor, pray for me. My pastor said, it's not about what your pastor said. It's not what your preacher or your prophet, prophet has said. It's what God says that makes a difference. So it's very important, actually. Extremely important. Because they don't value personal study of the word or communion with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has been given to each and every one of us. So if we don't study the word, the Holy Spirit will come in and intercede and say, do you know what this person means? Say no. He begins to minister. But now it's your pastor, you pay him and he does things for you. So consequently, they divide the devalue their spiritual worth and become co-dependent for whom God is a distant grandfather rather than the intimate father who he, who he should be. God should be our father. But now he's a grandfather because you have got a prophet 
is your father. The, the prophet has got a spiritual father. The spiritual father has got a spiritual father. By the time you reach there, 30, 40 of them, and they all submit to one person. I find it a perversion, actually. The word teaches clearly that we exist for the good pleasure of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Thou art, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are, and were created. So there is no, there is no mistake here to say maybe he didn't create us. He did create us for his own pleasure. So one simple act that makes this transition possible is to move from being a believer of Jesus Christ to become his ardent follower, his disciple. So to become in spirit and in truth a disciple of Jesus Christ, you need to clear the idol of the spiritual, uh, the spirit man, which makes growth pure and certain. The reason is that in truth, only disciples can obey their masters. Disciples can obey their masters. If somebody trained, like especially karate, those um, the fighting sports, camp sports, if they um, if you go into training karate or kung fu, what the master says goes. No discussion, nothing. Go and pick a bucket of water. They do it because that's what the master. The master demands. That is very important. So strangers, orphans, babes, and willing slaves. This is what we become if we are not wired to obey the Lord Jesus. We come as strangers because you don't know him. You come as a babe, you come as an orphan looking for pity. We come as a slave where you end up servicing a human being instead of praying to the living God. So the key is call, cost, and rewards of discipleship for our lesson today. Um, discipleship, no, sorry, I was asking for a drink. So the key is call, cost, and rewards of and rewards of um, discipleship. This is what we are going to look at today. The words of our discipleship. So what is the definition of a disciple? A disciple is a saint or a Christian indeed. You must be somebody that is willing to follow. There is a difference between a believer and a disciple. Anyone can claim to be saved based on the hearing the gospel and purporting to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the most popular scripture such people use to justify their shallow faith is in your heart you believe by your mouth you confess this Romans 10. That scripture speaks, however, of the key to enter the faith, that is faith in Jesus Christ expressed by receiving the revelation of him and confessing the same verbally. So on the other hand, a disciple is a saint who has transitioned from being a mere believer on Jesus Christ to the one who purposefully accepts his call to be his follower. When he met the, the disciples, he will say, would you follow me? They left everything and started following him. Sorry, I want to take a drink. So when a person becomes a follower, it means it's a huge thing. When you become a follower, you seek after which your master does. So the disciple seeks after the master and seeks to be more like him. That's why you want to be like your trainer, you want to be like your master. So God, in his love, in his benevolence, he made it Simple to enter the kingdom so that no one will excuse or will be, have an excuse on the rest. 
he doesn't expect anyone who enters the kingdom to remain at the door. So if you are coming, you don't say it at the door, say that I'm coming. Either you're in or you're out. The Bible makes it very clear. What is the explanation about discipleship? It's an invitation to enter into the kingdom in its fullness, not, stay, not staying at the door. No. It is a call for a deeper and more intimate, qualitative relationship with the Lord, which is real. That's why we say the Bible is new every day. It's a living word. So that invitation is the call which draws a believer into a life, into a life of seeking after the Lord for a deeper, intimate relationship with him, not looking for the blessings that he's given you. That you are alive is a blessing already. It is a state that makes you hunger and thirst for more of him, yet seeking more and more. I want to know you. I want to know who are you, God? Even Moses said, show me your glory. So when you are processed daily to be like him from glory to glory and never stopping until you see him in the ultimate glory, that is something significant. Until you see him, say, God, I'm not going to stop until I see him. So it's a confidential relationship with God rather than a casual one that he can commission you to represent him as his ambassador. So you need the real anointing of the Holy Spirit that produces a, trans, um, a transformed character and the empowered witness. Dying to self, you have got to die to self. Dying to self so that Jesus may occupy the throne of your heart. This requires loyalty from yourself to him. Lord, can I give you the right of way? Yes. Then you can manifest fully. This is an invitation to lose yourself at the cross and take up his life instead of your the core of being yourself. We can read Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 26. Matthew chapter 24, 16, verse 24 to 26. Can somebody read for us, please? Matthew 16, verse 24 to 26. Read in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Amen. Amen. The Bible makes it very clear. If you want, you must follow him. So he is warning us already. If you are coming to him, there is a cost, there is a price which you must pay for following the Lord. At times we answer too soon before we understand. That's why I always reiterate, I always talk and talk. Many people say, me, I want to serve God. It's not by might. It's a, it requires quite a lot. One, you don't have a private life. No, oh, this is my private life. Excuse me. The moment you signed up for the call, you don't have a private life. It's finished. Everything that you do in your private interests people in the public. It's just like that. You choose to be like a state president, a politician. Then you lose that life. Because you say you tell people, test me, rate me, see who I am. So it's very important to understand that, to lose yourself unto him. It's Galatians 2.20. That the life I now live, I live it for the Son of God. You lose yourself completely to him. And then pressing into the fullness of the purpose of God in creating and redeeming you. Why did God make you? To drive a car, 
No. To live in a better home? No. To school? No. You are not safe. You are not safe because you went to school. You are saved because you believed, and you are saved because you follow him. So your one is going to come to a place where Christ is the center of your life, where you find the fullness of comfort, this fullness of satisfaction in him alone. So it's very important. So the other thing that is extremely important is to discover and utilizing the properties which are part of your spiritual DNA, spiritual gifts, your talents, life experiences, this school that God asked us to go to school, education opportunities. If somebody is a tailor, you can be making gowns, clothes for people who are in holiness. Is it not, is it not an opportunity that God will give you? Skills, you did um, data something, I don't know how to call it. They, those people who do designing well, designing on something, they get these opportunities that God can give you, those that are in the gospel to sing, there are, there are many whose life have been transformed. They call the language of Christ. I want to see, because you said you are coming from a believer, a believer to a follower, a disciple. Anybody can believe, but the difference is you a follower. You a disciple. The one that you just read, the Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 26, the Lord Christ one day turned to those who were following him and made a, a demand on them. Are you following because of the meat or the fish? What are you following me for? If you don't deny yourself, if you don't deny your wife, but don't have and say, I'm denying you, no, that's not what is meant. He said, let him deny himself, take up the cross and follow me. This one, the Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, is a big contrast with Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Where he said, pick up your cross daily. Daily. It's a daily exercise. Broken down, these are the details of the benchmark, the benchmarks which he laid for those who, though called, wanted to be chosen for a more intimate relationship with him, which is called discipleship. Say, so if anyone, it was, he never said any. he said, if anyone, he said, if anyone. So the Lord established clearly the fact that for you to be, you have got to be a disciple rather than a mere believer. But it's a choice which you make. So the Lord does not force people to save him against their will. If you don't choose to save him, to God be the glory. Even in dramatically, when he arrested um, Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, he still gave him a choice whether to yield or not. In Acts chapter 9, verse 6, he says, that if anyone will come after me, so what did Christ come after me? He said, make it clear that the ultimate destination or the highest goal of a Christian life consists of coming to him. But now that's why I have always mentioned, brethren, listen to me, don't look up to me. I repeat, there is a difference. I am not the author and finisher of your faith. God is the Lord Jesus Christ. I am not the standard. I'm just used as a vessel, just like you, and we are just together. We are just the same. I don't come occupying a higher position or something, no. It's only that at times he gives you a privilege to minister to fellow brethren. Not that I'm much more holy than you are, no. That's why many of us miss the mark. So that is what he's saying now. A true disciple is one who pursues the Lord, trying, emulating every area of his life, their thoughts, words, deeds. That you cannot do when you're living in a pub. In a beer parlor. They said, ah, God looks only at the heart. The Bible, the Bible is making it very clear. If any man decides to, I'm trying to break it down because it's a teaching. If any, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. So he say he will come after me. So if you want to be a disciple, you have got to um to be like Jesus in your thoughts, in your life, in what you say. There are some people who look like they went to the school of wrong talking. 
they answer rudely, like they are a brother or a sister to Cain. Let him deny himself. The Lord Jesus Christ here is laying out a very critical condition, deny self. What do we mean when we say deny yourself? Sister Sonia, can you deny yourself? No. <laughs> what will be left if I deny myself? You cannot. So this is a combination of the soul and the body. These two dimensions make up what is called the carnal nature. Everything that you do, these are the these are two of our greatest enemies. When you wake up every day, these two, they're always fighting the old man. This is what called the old man. So this is what forms your carnal nature. So the carnal nature likes to be in control and he has to be vulnerable before God. You say, no, me, I don't want to fast off. It comes immediately to the top. Self like to occupy the throne of the heart, the very that at very same place reserved for the Lord Jesus Christ, well as Lord. Therefore, no one can possibly be a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and still be in control of their life. That's why I say you can never be a private citizen if you chose to follow the Lord. You've got to get that space so that you can come in. A disciple is of necessity one who will and is wholly sub subsumed by um by the will of God. It leads you to a state where God becomes the dwelling place of his people. I say, ah, oh, I'm at home. Even in difficulties, you don't see it. You see only Christ. He said, let him take up his cross daily. I, I like the, but the version of Luke. Discipleship involves a conscious decision to identify with the cross of Christ. Let me make it very clear. You can never be a Christian if you don't if you don't believe in the in the cross. That is where that is how we protest us through the cross. So praise the Lord. So one cannot be a disciple if you don't have if you don't uh, identify with the cross. The cross is not a fanciful place, uh, place brethren, no. Mm. A cross, this is the ultimate symbol of rejection, pain and suffering. There was no joy when he went to the cross, so there was no joy. Thorough beating, they beat him thoroughly. The Romans reserved it for crucifying the west of men by nailing them to the ragged cross. <clears throat> Hanging, hanging man and wood on the hilltop for all to see. So come and see this wicked person. That's why I say, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabakami, say, my Lord, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That pain of separation, even God could not withstand when he saw his only begotten son going to the cross. Now they are separated from all eternity. The first time the Lord Jesus Christ separated from the Father. So when you hear Christians say he was afraid, I will tell you, read your Bible very well. Sit down and understand the scriptures very well. He was not afraid. It was the pain of separation. Sin separates man from God, just like it did in um, Genesis chapter 3, where man fell and God separated from him. And he came to restore that communion between man and God. And he, so he went there, you know, the way that he suffers, it, it was something, it is something very painful. In my early years of Christianity, when I was reading the four Gospels, when I read about Christ going to the cross, oh, I would weep. So the Lord Jesus Christ is inviting those who desire to follow him to count the cost. And if they really want to go further, are you going to be humiliated? Look at this fool. Are you calling me a fool? Oh, we are already fighting. 
They called him the El Sebab, chief demons, chief of demons. You can imagine his own creation. It is a life where one is expected to make difficult choices. Friends that you kept before you must be prepared to leave them. We grew up together. Oh, yes, heaven is not good. You will not be together in heaven. That day, when you make the choice to follow him, you must be sure what you do. <clears throat> These are choices that may require us to be accused falsely, suffer wrongfully, or be passed on over in promotions where we clearly deserve yet without sin, meeting everything in the hands of he who judges righteously. Where your promotion is supposed to come, no, they overlook you. They overlook you. You are the most hardest working, but when it comes to that point, you become a victim. Saint Sonia, First Peter chapter two, First Peter chapter two, verse nineteen to twenty-three. First Peter chapter two, verse nineteen to twenty-three. And Sonia, are you available? First Peter chapter two, verse nineteen to twenty-three. Okay. Until I read in Jesus' mighty name. <clears throat> Says, read in Jesus' mighty name. <laughs> For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience, I'm sorry for that. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your fault, ye shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. 21. For even here unto where ye call, because Christ. Sorry. For even here unto where ye call, because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did not sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 23, who, when he was revived, revived not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Amen. Amen. This is another dimension of the cross we are called to carry, is that it represents the intersection of God and our will. Every time our will submits to the will of God, we are in a sense carrying our cross. That's what basically it means. It's like the cross now, your will and meeting the will of God, we are carrying your cross. So our cross as differs still according to our individual destinies our personalities, our lifestyles. That's why you see some are meant to achieve a little bit more because they've been given greater grace. They reached out to a bigger audience and there are some who are just called teach ministers of God, replicating themselves and going out to, going out to, to teach, to evangelize, and win souls for the kingdom. He said, you deny yourself and follow me. So this invitation is an invitation to follow the Lord, the Lord right up to the invitation. This is the place of the scar. It is an invitation to die with him so that you may live in him and through us. Apostle Paul puts it rightly in Galatians chapter 2.20. It is out of a crucified life that divinity issues 
out in its fullness to touch our lives. When you die to yourself, that's when people see you. That's why I say, are you Christ? I say, no, because you look like him. We are supposed to react physically, you don't. It is out of a crucified life that divinity comes out in its fullness. So the beautiful knows that the powerful Christian life is one which is crucified and therefore wholly yielded to the will and the presence of God. That is why he has created and foistered the church on another gospel, which is the point of the cross. That's why Apostle Paul said, uh, Galatians chapter 1, 6 to 10, I'm sure, where he said, if an angel or any one of us preaches another gospel, let it be a case. You cannot preach the gospel without the cross. I've seen ministers of God going for years without explaining the cross. That's why it's important to teach the people so that they know the word. This is the cross we are talking about. What is preached is the new plastic cross rather than old ragged cross. The old gospel or the other gospel causes an uncrucified man to worship God for the good life he will give them and robs the faith with the sharp cutting edge of a transformed life, which comes after a true encounter with God on the basis of the cross. Galatians chapter 6, verse 4 to 14. That's very important to understand. Until you come to that point, you can grow as a Christian. That is very important to understand. For whosoever shall save his life, he will lose it. And whoever will lose it for my sake, he will gain it. So those that refuse to pay the price and choose not to die to self, they may it look like they are enjoying life, but it's only for a short season, only to discover a folly when they face the prospect of eternity outside the Lord Jesus Christ, which is hellfire. If you see how many professing Christians are in hell, I thought I was a Christian. You know, everything begins to make sense, but it's too late. So the uncrucified life will always lead you to sin, and sin will always separate you from God. It is therefore clear that embracing the old rugged cross and allowing our carnal nature to be crucified until none of his motions oppress, oppress us is the only when you wake up, I want to pray. I want to be praying for two hours. I want to sing for one hour. Pray for one hour. Every day, I want to dedicate six hours to him. He will begin to minister to you. He doesn't ignore you. At the cross, deliverance that comes from being sincere before God takes place. When you are true before God, then you will say yes. So that truth now, the Lord Jesus Christ extends this call to all who purport to have received or to receive him as Lord and Savior. The Savior is the one who guarantees that the souls do not perish in the lake of fire. The Lord is he who will rule your life and determine what to say, what you think and do. Unfortunately, there are many believers. Um, how should I? There are many who receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, but they don't allow him to sit on the throne in your heart as the Lord. So you miss the essential principle. He can only guarantee a place in heaven as a savior to only those who have submitted to his lordship on earth until he becomes lord of your heart. Then there's, no, there's nothing in that he can do. Hence, we need to establish the truth that every believer is called to be a disciple of Christ. It is not an option reserved for a few in a priestly test. No. The gospel program is about producing disciples of Christ rather than mere believers who lack commitment. The great commitment, commitment is not a game at all. It's not a game of um, statistical manipulation or seeking full crowds in, into what we call churches today. 
No. This is something which begins with leading people to receive Christ as a savior. And it's a, a, that lifelong process of putting him or enthroning him and maintaining him as the Lord of your life. This is the principal objective of a teaching ministry. When you're saying you're teaching, I see people go out to teach with a shallow word. Until you've got the word, teach. So the word of God is thus applied systematically as food nourish the inner man to maturity. That's how a person begins to mature. As many as they respond to the call of the Lord Jesus Christ, they secure themselves due consideration as person ones. Remember the Bible, I think Matthew, uh, Matthew 20, verse 16, it said, many are called, but few are chosen. Like I've always said, you come and boast in your calling. It's not about your calling. It's about make that calling sure. I got. I was called for an interview. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You are called for the interview. Did you get the job? No. How many other candidates are coming? You don't know. How many people do they require for this position? You don't know. So it's always important for you to understand certain, certain things. That when you are coming in here, yeah, the Lord is looking for somebody that I am coming the way that I am. And I want to be sure that the Bible says, work out your, your salvation in fear and trembling. So we need to be sure. Those who stay on course until the end are redeemed as the faithful. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. You can read that one. Revelation 4, 17, verse 14. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. I read in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Says, they shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Them. So this is the profile of those who will make it to the end, the chosen and the faithful. It's a matter of response anchored on the will of an individual and will of an individual. How do you know the call to be a disciple? The last week we talked about experiential holiness. At that experiential level where, you, where it begins to minister into your life as an individual. So as a believer, you become dissatisfied with the routine life. You have an understanding that the pursuit of the things of this world is vanity. Therefore, you no longer derive your validity or satisfaction from them. I want something more. Hence, a void, a deep void within your heart that needs to be filled. You realize that there's um, a higher purpose for which God created and redeemed you, which you need to pursue and fulfill. You also realize there are deposits of grace in you which are not yet utilized or fully utilized. You receive specific messages from the Holy Spirit by revelation, dreams, vision, discernment, by quickening of the word, by impression in your heart, or having a burden, in, or um, by having a burden, or in any other way, he speaks, which leads you to seek him to a greater degree. The Lord orders your steps into a program, into a ministry, into a revival that can teach and transform your life. Responding to the call of call for discipleship, the cost involved. One familiar trick the devil does is to suggest to some Christians that they are not called. 
In doing so, the enemy uses a religious mindset to equate discipleship with a living monastic life, life inside religious, where people just come like um like the Buddha does. So you are not called. You must be like that a guru. So such men are, are filled with the pictures of the religious priests built on the Old Testament model. In this new uh, model, there is a small dichotomy between the two, the small and professional clergy and the large laity based on the pulpit versus the new uh, the division of so the, this is a clever trick of the enemy to keep the huge reserve manpower in the church frozen, just like that. God will have his in his church. He utilize the abandoned manpower that ought to be discipled, released into the vineyard, teach, train, equip, and release. Repl um, replicate yourself in a way that when people see you. part of this team say yes. There was they were, they were recognized from the quality teachings from the um the word how you grow they begin to see certain things in you to say this is the way that I want to be. So the Lord wants wants us to release. He wants us to release, uh, to rest or to to realize that no one. In the kingdom is in the kingdom by accident, and no one is useless. You no, know, we say you are a useless somebody. No, that's their opinion. It's the fact. Every true Christian is joined to the body and the Holy Spirit is uh, given gifts which are to be released, released to edify the other saints. Every saint is called to be a disciple of Christ and should emulate him in their life. Saving one another, that's very important. Reference scriptures, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Romans, uh, sorry, Romans, we can read Romans chapter 12 from verse 1 to 8. There are a lot of things that he covered. First Corinthians chapter 12, where the spiritual gifts are. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 to 16, where the fivefold has been explained and why it is necessary to work in a fashion that shows that the church is a living organism. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we are called to the priesthood, into the a royal generation. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. So the cost of discipleship that only a few are willing to pay in each generation is the choice to respond to the call of the Lord. The willingness to follow the Lord wholly without reservations. The choice to allow the word of the Lord to renew the mind and then change the perspective so that one can understand the truth and yield to the demand of the Lord. The choice to dethrone self-life. Hey God, I want to give you this. Come and sit in my heart. Forgive my whining, forgive my complaining. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God. He loved me and gave you his life for me. Until we come to that point, we we'll remain as babes. The willful embrace of the Lord Jesus Christ said that life, which is no longer driven by following material things, but by looking at the giver himself, not the gifts. The willful offering up of our beings as the Lord's born servants, whose entire pleasure is to do his will. Psalms chapter 50, verse 5. Psalms chapter 50, verse 5. Can somebody read for us Psalms 50? Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. It says, 
Gather my sins together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Amen. Amen. I will read uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 32. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 32. I read in Jesus. Sorry, 28, sorry, from 28 to 30. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy in my burden is light. This is the Lord telling us. It's easy to serve the Lord. It all comes down to one critical point. Personal decision. Ultimately, every Christian has the privilege of exercising their free will. Either in favor of accepting or rejecting the call of God for discipleship. You choose. God is not going to force you. So how does this um, accepting or answering the call of God affect the other relationships which we have? Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Matthew chapter 10, and I will read from 32 to 39. Matthew chapter 10, we will read from 10, from 32 to 39. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send place a peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set Man at variance against his father and the daughter against the mother, the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law, and the man's force shall be they of his own household. He that loveth the father, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worth of me. And he that loveth son or daughter or more is more than me is not worth of my love. Is not worth of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worth of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that lose it shall gain it. So the Bible makes it very clear. This is the definition of a accepting the call. He is not asking us to hate our family members. Let me try to clear this. He's not asking us to hear or, or dissociate from them. Rather, he means that his true disciples must make conscious choices to enthrone him as the Lord in the heart to such a degree that all other human relationships, they take second place. Parent, children, spices, any other thing that comes after. Why is it important? Extremely important. It is extremely important because if you value any earthly relationship more than him, you are gone. A disciple must therefore make a conscious decision to give him the prime place in your heart. What are the rewards? There are a lot of rewards for discipline in time, in this age that we are living and in eternity. Apostle Peter, I think it was Apostle Peter who said, um, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 27, he said something very significant. He said, behold, we have forsaken everything. Peter was complaining, we have left everything. He said, no, we are going to get everything on this earth. That was the Lord Jesus Christ himself talking about it. You will get your reward here. God is an equitable personality. He distributes fairly. He never makes demand on people without commensurate rewards or punishment 
that is attached to it. There are some, these are some of the rewards that lie in store for a true self. A life of true liberty in Christ Jesus with freedom from the bondage of the flesh and the body, which makes many Christians carnal. A life free from the pressure of materialism and this spirit of acquiring. This is the blessedness of owning nothing yet having all in him. One is freed from the participation in the right dress of life and constantly being in the first lane. The Lord Jesus Christ, um, the Lord Jesus Christ centered and honoring lifestyle is the one that we must be living a victorious life. So your life must be centered and honoring him. It's very important. John chapter 15, verse 1 to 7, abide in me so that I can abide in you and my father. He was just uh, playing with a poem. The privileges of being a son of God, mature enough to hear his word and be led by the spirit. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, which shall be called the sons of God. The blessed life of seeking, discovering, and fulfilling every purpose for which he was created. Jeremiah chapter 29. He said, I know. I created you. I knew you in your mother's womb. So we need productivity in serving the Lord. Productivity is what is lacking. The privilege of constant access to Heavenly Father in prayer. Brethren, that is huge. Privilege of constant access of talking to God. It keeps him and gets your uncluttered heart that is pure. We can read later Psalms chapter 15, verse 1 to 5. Psalms 24 from 3 to 6. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are they pure in heart for the child in the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. For the peace with all men and live a holy life. Or without the Lord, without without holiness, no one is going to see the Lord. John chapter 5, verse 14, 15. You are the salt of the world. A, a light can, cannot be hid under the table. Trust and faith in God, which yield up all that he has provided for you. For his disciples, his servants, all his needs will be met. Deuteronomy chapter 28, where says the blessings and curses. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 to 14. Since I was born, I have never seen a, a righteous man begging for food. I think it's Psalms 37. So material blessings and all that pertain to life, godliness are at their disposal. True disciples know that every assignment given by the Father is an allocation of resources, and all they need to do is to ask in faith. In some cases, before they call, resources are made available. Where there seems to be tiring, they have no room for fretting, memory, but rather a quiet trust in the wisdom and timing of their father. In rounding up eternal rewards in the year after. Eternal rewards when you die, you go to that side of eternity. Yes. Two disciples are just not content with the entry into the eternal phase. There's no way you can come and stay at the door. Enter. The yearn for the crowns and stars that the Lord promised those who invest in turning many into righteousness. Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, um, 29. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Those are the last five prophecies I will give. Questions, contributions. If you have got questions, contributions, please feel free.